You're going to want to see this. I'm going to turn an entire bowl with only three tools. Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. You know, I get asked often, can I turn a bowl without a chuck? Do I have to buy a chuck in order to turn a bowl? Well, a chuck makes things a little bit easier, but guess what? You don't have to buy a chuck. As a matter of fact, you only need a few tools to turn a wood bowl without a chuck. And I'm going to turn this bowl today with just these three tools. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I need to center up this bowl blank. This is a piece of poplar that has spalted really nice. Uh, the spalting visible on the sides is really, really beautiful. So I'm kind of really curious to see how this bowl turns out. So I'm going to be using a spur chuck to mount this end to end on the lathe. If you want to learn more about this spur chuck and other ways to mount bowl blanks to the lathe, check out my video. So I'm bringing up the tailstock. Basically, this is just going to be held between centers with the tension of the tailstock. Now, what's important is I need to tighten that tailstock up continuously and remember to continuously continuously tighten it as I'm turning because with the rotation of the lathe and the vibration of the tool in that the end-to-end -end turnings can loosen up so you want to continuously tighten up that tailstock. Now I'm using a half inch bowl gouge. This is a half inch shaft with a 3 8 inch flute. It's a relatively small bowl gouge for these roughing cuts here initially especially going through the bark. This isn't the, the most ideal way to do this. I would use a heavier bowl gouge typically. But what I want to illustrate is that you can actually create a bowl with very minimal tools. And I'm only using this single bowl gouge as the only cutting tool in this process. Right there you saw the, the lathe vibrate a little bit It's because my speed is up just a little bit too high. So I had to bring that speed down so I don't see or feel any vibration in the lathe. And the reason it's vibrating is the fact that this bowl blank is not balanced. We've got bark areas and different areas that need to be dealt with. As the blank becomes more balanced while I'm turning, I'm going to be able to bring that speed up. I'll tell you, the bark is the toughest part to work through. It's incredible how difficult bark can be sometimes. This particular bark is, is held in place really well. Some bark will just flake right off and it's no big deal. As I continue making this curve, this blank is chewing up and it's becoming more balanced. So I'm able to bring the speed up just a touch, but not enough yet to really make a big difference. So I'm just going to keep working this material away until we start getting a shape here. Now this is going to be the bottom of the bowl that you see in front of you here. So we're going to be reversing this eventually. Look at that spall it's starting to become visible here. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Now remember, through this whole process, continue to adjust your tool rest. Make sure that it's adjusted so that your tool cutting edge is on center. And you want to keep that rest up as close as possible to your turning piece without getting too close. Check out that video uh, about the tool rest that I have in my library here on YouTube. And you can see what I'm doing. And basically it's a choppy cut here because I keep getting bounced around with the positive and negative areas and the the bark as well so it's not smooth by any means yet but you basically just keep working through this layer by layer until we start getting a smooth continuous cut and that'll happen once all that bark and those negative spaces are removed this wood is a few years old and it's starting to get a little punky or it's dried out a bit so I got to be really careful how I treat the, the ingrained and I have a whole video on that on ingrained tear out so I'm gonna have to be aware of that as I'm turning this entire piece because that's gonna be an issue on especially on the ingrained 
As you notice here, as I'm making this push cut from right to left, I've angled the flute of the gouge. Well, here I'm actually making a face cut. I'm, I'm going to flatten out this face so we can get this established. And I'm going to make sure that this is smooth and level all the way across. And one of the ways to check that is to put the bull gouge right up against this surface. And the shaft of the bull gouge is straight and true. So you should be able to see that your, your face is true as well. Now I'm using my dividers to determine the width of the face plate. The face plate is going to be mounted on this end, and that's how we're going to reverse this blank on the lathe. So I'm going to use the left side of the dividers only. The right side is used as a kind of a guide. I'm eyeballing and seeing if that line that I'm scribing is directly under the right side. Then I know I have the width established. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove a little indentation here. And this is going to help me center up the face plate once I take this blank off the lid. These are very light cuts. The flute is relatively open. This is a backwards pull cut and we want to do this very lightly here. If you notice as I move across this with the flute that open or pointing almost at 12 o'clock, you want to be very careful and make really light cuts. Don't become aggressive with the flute in that position. That's a good way to get a nasty catch. So I'm going to smooth out some of those areas just a little bit more. I need this to be relatively flat. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but I want it to be relatively flat. So again, with the flute pretty open, I'm making a super light cut right there. All right, it's time to sharpen again. Sharpening this bull gouge is going to be critical throughout this turning. And actually with spalted wood, spalt is actually mineral deposits from fungus. And those mineral deposits are harder than the steel. And they'll actually wear down that cutting edge as well. So I'm going to be sharpening frequently throughout this turning. If you want to learn more about shaping and sharpening all of your tools for wood bull turning, check out my online tool sharpening e-course. There's a link below in the description. All right, so I'm just going to continue knocking down the side materials and trying to get this blank balanced a little bit more. You can see on the on the edges there, you can see how there's a high spot and a low spot, and that's what's contributing to the, the piece not being balanced. As soon as that's leveled off, however, we're going to start having a a more true turning and we'll be able to uh, turn up the lathe speed a bit. The purpose for marking where that face plate is going to be is to give me an idea of how much space I need to leave at the bottom of this blank. This is a relatively large blank so I, I'm basically going to remove a bunch of material here at the base of this bowl and there's going to be some waste material right where that face plate is based on the, the screws that will be in the face plate. And we'll see that in just a minute. These are aggressive cuts. I am on the left wing of the bull gouge here. And I'm making very aggressive cuts just to remove material. It is clearly tearing out the end grain pretty dramatically. But that's not a big issue at this point. My, my main concern is to remove material. I'm not trying to make a, a super smooth finish at this point. So here you can see I'm taking probably uh, 3 eighths of an inch wide pass as I'm cutting this. And now I'm going to change my body position and make a pull cut. This is also going to be using utilizing that lower wing. And you can see here it's, it's getting close to 3 eighths of an inch or almost a half an inch, about a centimeter or centimeter and a half width that I'm pulling off there. And again, this is just to remove material. I'm not trying to make a smooth cut here. But as I move from right to left, I've got the bull gouge flute in about the 1030 position. If the flute straight up is 12 o'clock, it's rotated to the left at about a 10.30 position. 
All right, I really need to take those high spots down on the side so that we can get the lathe speed up. So I'm just going to make a, a side cut here right across the edge and smooth up that edge. That's going to give me the ability to get that the lathe speed up. Now, the tool rest has to be positioned just right for this. So if you need to know more about the tool rest, check out the video I've got on uh, all the information you need to know about using your tool rest on the lathe. I have a lot of down pressure on the tool rest here with my left hand and I'm not moving my hands or arms, I'm actually shifting my body weight only and gliding the bull gouge across the tool rest. You do not want to be trying to manipulate the bull gouge with your hands or your arms. You instead want to just shift your body weight. Just relax your knees and move your the core of your body forward and that's going to slide the bull gouge across and make a nice straight path across the tool rest. Okay, so now that the bull blank is starting to become a little more true, we can speed this up quite a bit. And it's going to give us the opportunity to make a smoother cut as well. Now this nub in the center here is a concern of mine. I'm going to take this off. And the reason is, is I want to be able to have a clear mark from the tailstock where the base of this is once we get down the road. So I'm looking forward here a little bit. So I want to remove this material. I have to be careful. This this material is fragile. You can see the dryness in the end grain right there. So I'm not going to do any more turning here. I don't want to lose this and have it come flying off the lathe. Instead, I'm going to take it off for just a minute. And then I'm going to use a chisel and a mallet and knock that, that little nub off of there. It's not going to take much. This dry, this wood is dry and and it comes off very easily. And I'm just kind of eyeballing the faceplate at this point. We're not quite ready to put the faceplate on there, but I just want to see what it's looking like. Okay, so I'm going to put this back on the lathe. I just needed to get that excess material and the nub out of the out of the way so that I can get a good clear connection here. Now I'm going to set this up. I can see that it's not balanced at the moment. One of the ways to balance this very easily is to move the tool rest, put your thumb next to it, and then feel the high spot. And when the high spot touches your thumb, move that to the top, loosen the tailstock, and drop the bull blank down just a touch. Now look at that. It's not perfectly true, but it's a lot. It's turning a lot truer than it was originally. All right, so now I'm going to continue turning. I've got a good clean connection point there and a mark that the tool rest, or the, I'm sorry, that the tailstock is making into the base of the bull plane. Now I know where my faceplate's going to be. I know how much area I need down there, and I can get the, the lathe speed up. And I'm going to become much more aggressive removing this material at the base of the bowl. Again, I know I've got a waste material there right at the very bottom because I'm going to have the screws in it from the faceplate that's going to be attached. So I want to clear that area out and just kind of disregard it because we won't be too concerned with that area. That's not going to be part of the bowl. Again, very wide, aggressive cuts here. But all the pressure is down on the tool rest and just gliding the tool across the surface of the wood and let the wood be cut by the, the edge of the tool. You don't want to force the bull gouge into the wood. You just want to glide it across it and remove that material. These are all supported grain cuts. And what that means is the fibers underneath the fibers that are being cut are longer. Therefore, they're supporting the cut. However, because this wood is so dry and the ingrain is somewhat punky, being this aggressive is still going to give me tear outs on that ingrain. So when I get to the point where I'm ready to make a nice smooth finish on this, I need to make much lighter cuts. For right now, this is... Again, just a roughing cut. 
This is also where I'm trying to determine the shape of this bowl and what I'll be doing with it. Because I have enough material to work here, it, I think I'm going to do something that's a kind of like a deeper V-shaped bowl, almost like a, a cone. And here you can see how much material I have. Now that first inch or so at the base of this is going to be wasted because of the screws that will be in it. But I have a, quite a bit of material to work with here. Now I do have some cracks up along the top of this that are going to need to be removed. So I don't have the full width that you see here from left to right. I'm going to have to remove some of that top edge because there's some cracks in the pith area that's still there. Look at that spalt. That's incredible. You can see the tear out that's occurring on the end grain there. So again, I'm trying to get the shape established. So I'm going to do some more aggressive cuts. This is a kind of a pull scraping cut. And each chance that I get to, I'm also continually tightening up that tail stock as well. Because as you turn, those spikes from the spur chuck are going to keep working their way into the bulb blank. And if they work their way in there and become loose, then there's a chance that the blank could come dislodged. So you want to continuously tighten up that tailstock. And I want to establish the base of where this bowl will be, and that's where that, that angle that I'm creating at the bottom of the blank. And I'm just using a push cut. Again, we're going from right to left, and I have the flute angled at about the 10 o'clock position. So I'm actually cutting on the bottom left wing. Now, if, this is also a supported cut that we just talked about a minute ago. That means that the length of the grain fibers underneath what I'm turning have a longer grain. If you want to learn more about that, check out my video about which direction to turn the supported wood grain cuts. It's actually a really important aspect of wood bowl turning that you need to understand. And it requires a little more information than what I can provide you here. But go check that out in my channel video list. Now I'm starting to take some lighter cuts here because I'm getting close to a shape that I'm liking as far as the exterior or the potential exterior for this bowl. The lighter that you make these cuts, the, the less ingrained tear out there will be. And that's going to be important, especially with this drier wood. Okay. Now we're going to mount this blank to the face plate. I want to center this up using the indented area. And we need to look at these screws before we get in there. They're up almost an inch long or about 2.5 centimeters. I need to remember that, that measurement. Now if you want to learn more about what you should do and shouldn't do with a faceplate, check out my video all about faceplate. Now I'm looking straight down in that mark that the tailstock made and lining that up with the center. And then I'm going to start the first screw, but I'm not going to set it all the way in. I'm going to start one on the opposite side and then set that one. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that I keep the faceplate centered the whole time. If I tighten that first one, it's going to torque and twist the, the faceplate a bit and it's going to become off center. So those three are holding it in center and I'm just going to go ahead and put in the remaining screws. By the way, this is a impact driver to drive these in with a square driver bit and it works amazingly well. I have all these tools links in the description below. You can check those out. Now, when you put something on, we put a faceplate on the lathe, hold the blank and turn the hand wheel of the headstock. 
That way you reduce the chance of stripping those threads. Now, even though the faceplate's holding this securely, you want to bring the tailstock up for added support, especially with the size of this right now. And I'm marking the area that needs to be removed at the top. There's cracks in there, so all of that area is going to be removed. Now, down here where the screws are, I'm going to mark that one inch area, and that way I'll remember not to be turning into that area That's, and not to be including that in the bowl design. This is all going to be wasted area at this point. So that's a good idea just to keep that marked so you're, you remember why that's marked and keep that in mind. Now here you can see the crack that's going across the top of that. I'm going to remove all of that material here. I'm just going to do some really simple push cuts. Now I'm going from left to right and the bull gouge flute is approximately at the 1 o'clock or 1.30 angle as I'm making this push cut from left to right. I'm only putting pressure, I'm only putting down pressure with my left hand on the tool rest. My left hand is being used to keep the tool rest on, I'm sorry, the bull gouge on the tool rest and keep that pass a nice smooth continuous flow from left to right. And again, there's no arm or body movement or arm or hand movement here. It's all of the movement is created by shifting my body weight. I've relaxed my knees and I'm shifting my body weight from where I'm starting initially until I glide forward. What you want is you want your you want to stand so that you're about in the center of the pass, right about there, and you're standing straight up. So you kind of tilt yourself back just a little bit to start, and then you're tilting just a little bit forward. You don't want to be over leaning or stretching. Here you can see that angle of the flute a little bit better. Also, take a look here. You see those lines in the bowl that look like a record player? They're like grooves in there. That's an indication that my cutting pass is too fast but I'm just roughing material out here so I don't really care about that if I were trying to make a nice smooth finished cut here I would need to slow the pace of my bowl gouge down quite a bit in order for the lathe to give the lathe enough time to bring the bowl blank around to make a nice smooth cut instead I'm kind of cutting a little bit faster than the bowl is being rotated so two ways of fixing that, either slow my pace down or speed the lathe up, one of the two, and that's going to give me a smoother finish versus the, the lines that you're seeing in there, the grooves that are being created. But again, it's not that big of an issue right here because this is a roughing cut. Now I want to get this nub out of the way, and remember, the tool rest, or I'm sorry, the tailstock is not necessary at this point. I'm basically just, just pulling it out of the way, and I'm going to whittle this nub down so I've got a nice smooth surface all the way across the bowl. And remember the the bowl is rotating at the slowest speed in the center so if you don't want to rip out fibers you want to take a, a slow slow cut right up to that center point. All right, so now we can start to see the shape of the bowl. And what I need to do, it's not quite perfectly true here. You can see there's a little bit of wobble in that bowl. I need to true up the exterior of the bowl before I can continue here. So in order to do that, I'm going to start making push cuts from the base of the bowl up to the rim. And that's going to be a supported green cut. Again, check out that video on which direction to cut supported green cuts. It's really important to understand if you don't already understand that. I was slightly off bevel there, so I was getting on some tool marks because I was up on the tip of the tool. And at this point, I really want to start making lighter cuts so that I'm cleaning up that surface. Here you can see the push cut a little bit better. Now, the lighter cuts are going to help to clean up the edge or the tear out that's occurred on that ingrain. And if you want to know more about how to take care of tear outs, check out my video that talks and deals with this in much more detail.
by doing this work on the exterior, now the, the bowl is going to be turning completely true now on the faceplate. Remember, we were originally mounted from on the spur chuck end to end, and when I switch between the spur chuck to the faceplate, the, the center is not going to be perfectly true, and it's going to be almost impossible to make it perfectly true. But doing what we just did there will correct all of that and clean up the exterior of the bowl and make it turn true and balanced. So now I'm going to establish the rim of the bowl, and I'm going to start removing material that's going to be taken away from the inside of the bowl. And I'm just going to leave the tailstock there for now so that I've got good support as I'm making this, these cuts. I like to move down the side of the bowl and remove the center material slowly and gradually as I go. This gives me much more stability versus clearing out the center of the bowl and working outward. So what I do is I basically make a, like a small ditch on the side and remove material from the, the center of the bowl and keep bringing that whole center area down. This is a right to left push cut. And again, that bull gouge flute is angled at about the 10 or 1030 position. And I'm cutting on the left front tip of the bull gouge. And these are relatively aggressive cuts. Again, this is designed for roughing or removing material. This is not designed as a finishing cut at this point. And I'll just keep removing this material until I get down to, to basically reduce that whole center area at this point. I can back the tailstock away. You can see how dry and brittle that material is in the middle there. This is going to just break off. All right, and I can smooth out that area and then start making another ditch down the side. It's going to give me room to start making that the side cuts here. So now I'm going to establish the wall thickness. I want to bring the bull gouge in close to the 9 o'clock or a 90 degree angle like at the 3 o'clock position to start so I don't get a kickback. Kickbacks occur when you present the bull gouge at an angle to the edge of the bull. And I have a video on that on how to stop kickbacks if you want to check that out. So what I'm doing here is I'm just, just working the first couple inches of the inside of the bull wall to establish the wall thickness and get that area started. And I'm going to slowly work away more of the material in the center. Now, the advantage of having that center mass is going to be stability. The whole bowl itself and the sidewalls have a tendency to flex if there's no mass in the center of the bowl. Leaving that mass there is going to create a ton of stability for you, especially if you're turning a really thin wall bowl or if you're doing like a natural edge bowl. It prevents those, those wings from flapping, especially like in a natural or a live edge bowl. So now I've picked up that wall thickness. I'm going to stop the lathe. I need to check this frequently. The best way to check it is use your fingers and you can determine really quick where a thick area might be. Now, I'm, this is important. I'm looking from above. I'm looking at the outside of the bowl and the, the bevel of the bowl gouge and I'm making those two parallel. And instead of bending over and looking into the bowl, I'm keeping my I at where the bull gouge is inside the bull compared to the exterior of the bull. So we've got the wall thickness established. Now we simply just remove more of the center material, get that out of the way, and then we'll continue down the, the sidewall. The nice thing too about going back and forth with the, the left side, doing this left cut push cut is that we're using the left wing and we're using the white 
the right wing, I say that 10 times fast, the white wing, <laughs> we're using the left cutting wing and the right cutting wing um, somewhat equally, and they're going to wear down and uh, evenly as well. So when we sharpen, we always want to sharpen both wings no matter what. But if we're just using one of the sides of the bull gouge, the other side's kind of getting sharpened needlessly. So that's something to keep in mind here. It's, it keeps your tools sharp longer and is to work from both sides. So I'm right here, I'm like I said, I'm using the left side of the bull gouge. Always, always readjusting that tool rest to give us the most support possible. Now I'm going to be using the right side of the bull gouge when I'm making left to right cuts. And I'm just slowly making light cuts and taking the material down to where I match the previous wall thickness. Now, the camera is set up so you're looking inside the bowl, but I'm standing above this and I'm trying to determine where the bowl gouge is in relationship to the exterior of the bowl blank. Here I'm making a really light cut, picking up that previous area that was left off. Now we'll stop the lathe and check it again. You feel anything that's out of line or not looking right there, this is, this is the time to address it. The other aspect of using this technique is you don't want to go back up the walls. Here I'm changing and putting in my curved tool rest so that I can get a little bit better support inside this curve. We don't want to go back up the walls so as that center mass is being re removed those walls, the side walls of the bull ha will have more of a tendency to flex. If you go back up to the top of that bull and try to turn it again, you could run into the fact that that might be flexing and you can have problems with an uneven cut and or damaging the bull because it's it you get a catch and it damages the, the wood on the rim. So essentially what you do with this technique is you start from the rim and work your way down, but you don't go back up to where you've where you've been before because again that center mass is gone it's not supporting the the bowl now this bowl has relatively thicker walls because this wood is so soft if i were to make this a thin wall bowl it would be so fragile that it would it would simply break if it ever fell or anything like that so i'm making these walls a little bit thicker so the flex isn't really so much of a factor on this particular bowl but it's just a good principle to practice is to not go back up those walls now i'm finding a high spot right here and one of the ways to make sure you just deal with just that high spot is to mark it with a pencil. And you can use an open flute approach. You can see here I'm almost, I'm at 12 o'clock there, but I'm making a really light cut just across the top of that high spot. You want to be very careful when you have the flute open that much because if, you're, if you grab the wood too hard, you're going to get a nasty catch. So here I'm taking the, the side wall down again and picking up right where I left off. Really light cuts there. And now I'm going to blend all of those edges together with one light pass. All right, and then we'll keep removing that center area. There's something that's kind of therapeutic about making these grooves and it's almost like a zen garden or something where there's it's just uh, very relaxing to cut those grooves now this would be a good location for a micro bevel bowl gouge but i wanted to take the challenge and just do this entire bowl with one bowl gouge and this is my 55 degree swept back bowl gouge the 55 degrees is really close to the 65 degrees of the of the micro bevel if you want to learn more about the micro bevel bowl gouge check out my video called secret weapon the micro bevel bowl gouge and it'll explain all the details 
But again, this this bull gouge is this is my main go-to bull gouge. It's a 55 degree swept back bull gouge, and it can do almost anything. That's why I like it so much. Here, I really want to check the wall thickness, feel for any high spots, because we're getting really close to the base of this, and we want to make sure we've dealt with everything we need to deal with right here. Again, this is a very, very light cut. I've got that flute very open, but I'm, I'm just making a very light cut. That's feeling better. Now I need to remove that nub in the center and then merge everything so we've got a nice smooth curve in the base of this bowl. So I'm going to slowly work this high spot off and I have to remember to go slow right at the center. That's the slowest moving part of the entire bowl. To understand that a little bit better go check out my video on uh, wood lathe speed. So now I'm kind of backed up a little bit made a really light cut to merge all this together. I'm going to do it one more time. Super light cut to merge all the sections together and bring it together right at the center. And there we are. Look at that spalt. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible what nature does. Alright, so now it's time to sand it. I'm not going to bore you guys with all the details of sanding, but essentially what I'm doing here is I'm working through my grits I'm working through, I um, actually started at 80 because I had such an issue with that ingrain. I want to smooth out that ingrain as much as possible. So I turn with the lathe on, or I sand with the lathe on, and then I stop the lathe, and then I touch up areas that need to be touched up. Touch up areas where there's scratch marks, things of that nature. In this case, I'm working on that ingrain. And then I just work through my grits. And I usually stop at 320. Now, if you want to learn more about how to sand wood bowls, check out this video I've got. It covers all the details about how I sand my wood bowls. It's not a process to overlook. You basically want to make sure that you're doing a good job sanding. But you also don't have to be so tedious with it that it becomes annoying. Because I, I, it's it's obviously not the most exciting thing, but it's um, it's pretty important if you want to have a good, a good bowl at the, as a conclusion. Now, one of the big things that I teach about sanding wood bowls is don't, don't sand the center of the bowl with the lathe running. Because it's almost impossible to sand right up to the center point. And what happens is if you sand up to that center point and then go beyond it, then you've sanded this around the center point twice. And when you do that, you're going to make this, this weird little groove right around the, the very middle of the bottom of the bowl. So instead, go up to the center point, but don't hit the center point with the lathe running. And then with the lathe off, just hand sand that center area. You see here, I was stopped at the center point. I don't go up to the center point. Now I've rounded off the inside of this rim too, where it connects with the side walls. And now I'm going to sand that center point by hand. I'm just going to go over it with the grain. I'm going to flip it and do it from both directions so I don't get any kind of ruts forming in there. And then I go through the grits. I go 80, 120, 180, 240, and then 320. I do the exterior and the interior and get all of that sanded so it's all taken care of. I'm being really careful with the, the way I'm working around those, the rim there because that's actually shaping that curved inside curved rim so it's becoming part of the design there. I want the outside to remain relatively crisp and sharp but I want the inside rim to be curved. All right, so now it's time to take the bowl off the lathe and off the face plate. I better put something underneath that so I don't damage that rim. So I'm going to take the face plate off. Now we still have this big bottom on this. Now some people I've seen do turnings without using a chuck and they'll they'll just cut it off with a saw. Well, that's going to leave a really ugly flat bottom and I don't like that at all, so we're not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this chunk of wood that I've turned a long time ago. It's just rough turned. It's a cylinder and I'm going to attach the faceplate to this cylinder. 
this cylinder is going to become a jam chuck. So I'm going to put this on the lathe and we're going to go ahead and shape it. I'm going to, I'm going to curve the outside of it and then shape the outside so it's true. Right now it's just a rough piece of wood. Now, If you want to learn all about how to uh, make a jam chuck and, and what they're all about, check out my video on jam chucks. So I'm curving the outside of this and getting that smoothed out. What I want to do is I want the tip of this to, to match or at least roughly match or fit the interior of the, the bowl that we just turned. I'm going to go ahead and make a, a push cut here to true up the sides of this. It doesn't take a lot of time to make the jam chuck and the cool thing about the jam chuck is, is you can you can make multiple ones, different sizes and that, and you can also uh, reshape them if you need to for another turning later. Or they almost become universal, where you can, uh, you can use them over and over again without doing anything to them. So I'm going to take the bowl and just check, kind of looking down in there. Yeah, this is going to fit pretty well there. So let me clean up the end of this. Now the very tip of this, you don't want it to come to a point, otherwise it's going to kind of drill a um, a little you know, divot inside the, the base of your bowl. So instead what you want is you want to be a divot inside the, the jam chuck. Here you can see I'm making a slightly concave and that's going to give me a nice ring where the jam chuck will contact the inside of the bowl. So instead of the jam chuck coming to a point, it's got a nice ring in there. So I put a piece of foam packing material in there to secure it so it doesn't damage the inside of the bowl that we just finished sanding and I'll bring the tailstock up and now I'm going to match the tailstock right up to that little point that was on there originally when we were on the lathe the first time. So now I'm going to go ahead and start removing the area at the base of this bowl. It's kind of like removing the tenon. So everything I'm doing here is similar so if you want to check out this video I've got about removing the tenon you're going to learn about how I'm merging in the shape of the of the bowl here and removing this material. So check out that video. So right now what I'm doing is I'm I'm taking the the sides of this bowl down and I'm kind of shaping the foot of the bowl and merging that shape into the side of the bowl at the same time just kind of eyeballing it. Now you want to look across at the whole piece as you're turning it kind of design wise to see what you're what you're getting and what you want so i'm liking the way this works now I'm, this is kind of a, an unsupported cut here but i'm doing this just to finish up this little bit of area here and i'm making it super light so it shouldn't be tearing out in grain too much all right it's looking good now i need to merge that little seam together with the existing side of the bowl And the way I'm doing this is I'm positioning the tool rest so I've got about a 90 degree support for the bowl gouge and now I'm using a shear scrape. The shear scrape is really nice for making a really light subtle refinement to the exterior of your bowl. And what it does is I'm basically just shaving off the area between that cut that I just made and the original shape of the bowl. And that's looking pretty good. I'm going to get some of that other material at the base. This is all that waste material that has the screw holes in it. I'm getting all that out of the way, just making a push cut straight into the headstock. Now I want to start truing up the, the foot of the bowl. So I'm going to make a really light cut on the side of the bowl foot so that I've got a really clean edge there. And then I'm going to true up the, the actual foot that will be sitting on the tabletop. So I've got a nice 
flat, flush area there. Now I want the inside to be concave a little bit. I don't want this to be completely flat so it potentially wobbles around. We want the inside to be removed a little bit and concave. Now some people will just stop here again and just cut this off with a, with a saw. And you can do that, but there's really no reason why you can't take the time and shape the foot of the bowl and make it, make it really nice. Now I'm going to go through all the grits again and sand this transition area from what I just removed to the edge of the bowl. And I won't bore you with all of those sanding videos. Now I'm going to nibble away this interior. I'm going to, again, I'm going to make it a little bit more concave here. And the little nub there, well, I have to be careful because I already know this wood is dry and brittle and I'm not going to take a chance. I'm going to re reduce it a bit here, but I'm not going to try to turn this off. If you want to see what happened <laughs> in this video about the nutty bowl, um, you can see what happens when you try to turn with the nub that has got compromised wood on it. Yeah, I actually threw that nutty bowl off the lathe and it's all there. You can watch it. So go check that out. So I'm going to turn this down probably right about here. That's going to do it. And I'm going to go get my little Japanese saw and cut that, cut the, the rest of that nub off. Now I've got to be really careful here that the saw doesn't accidentally touch the edge of the foot and scratch up that the foot area. So I've got to release the pressure on the tailstock too because it's it's binding up the saw. So I'm going to release it just a little bit more. And there we go. Now I've got the nub is removed. There's a little bit there and that can that'll easily sand off. I usually sand off the nub of the foot of the bowl with about a 120 grit, maybe 180. What you want to do is you want to work a little bit on one side and then flip the bowl over so you don't you're not making a divot anywhere. That way you have it nice and balanced. flip it over and then just kind of balance it off. And that nice little spalt line in there is telling me that when I've got everything positioned just right and everything's smoothed off. All right, well, here it is. Check this out. I've got to tell you, this spalted poplar keeps surprising me with each piece that I turn. The colors and the patterns are just absolutely stunning. Just an absolute gorgeous piece from a relatively plain type of wood but once that spalt is introduced in it, it just gets absolutely stunning. So now the real question is why would you want to turn a bowl without using a four jaw chuck? Well, maybe you want to win a bet with your woodworking friends. That's one reason, but usually the main reason is, is that these little guys are not cheap. And if you're just getting started in wood bowl turning, you may not want to commit to the to the cost of buying one of these right off the bat. If you're turning spindles or pins or things of that nature, and you kind of want to experiment with turning wood bowls, using the face plate and the end-to-end -end mount method that I showed you in this video is a great way to start and see what you think about turning wood bowls. And once you get into it, you're probably going to find that you're going to want to get yourself a four jaw chuck because it just makes things a lot easier. But in the meantime, you can do with just a face plate and you can get some great results. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've liked it, do me a huge favor, click that like button. If you're not subscribing currently, I don't know why you're not subscribing because I've got tons of great videos for you. So please subscribe. I need you to subscribe. It helps the channel. It helps everything. So please subscribe. And if you've ever turned a wood bowl without a four jaw chuck, Leave me a comment below and tell me all about it. What method did you use? Did you use a face plate? Did you put a glue block on? What did you use? And how did you turn that bowl without a four jaw chuck? So as always, like I like to end my videos, until next time, happy turning.